Okay, so very happy today to have a presentation on you get what you measure. And I will say that this was so fundamentally important to me, I totally absorbed it and forgot who taught it to us first. So very thrilled that we're looking at it together deliberately and that we have a great speaker prepared to tell us what he thinks about it. So, Toby, please take the camera. Okay. Well, I, I would start the paragraphs like Hemming did with well and now. <laughs> and, uh, well, today's talk is about uh, Hemming's uh, session, original chapter 29 in his book, You Get What You Measure. Um, let me share the screen. And uh, to get us into the topic and to warm us up, I would like to start with citation of him, a quote, we have methods of measurement which get the kind of results we want. But are they relevant? Are they repeatable? Uh, what else could be measured but isn't? All the way through his chapter, he is talking about, do we measure the right things? And do we measure the right things in the right way? Or do we just focus on the easy things because they are easy to measure? And first, I would like to start with measurements and organizations. He's coming up with uh, two examples. The first one is a bunch of, a couple of fishers going out to the sea using a net. And uh, when they caught all the fish and they did some measurements, they said, okay, there must be a minimum size of fish out in the sea. If you think about it, <laughs> it's right. But when you think a little bit longer about it, it could be that the mesh size of the net is uh, not the right tool to measure the minimum size of the fish. And the same we come up with long-term versus uh, short-term planning as an example to start a session and said, okay, um, is it really helpful to plan or to have a plan for the next week and uh, to, to measure the effectiveness of a company or battalion by the effectiveness of reaching short-term goals or is it maybe better to have long-term goals and evaluate people by their long-term goals. Um, for example, rating systems. Um, when you hire people for a company, um, you have some expectations of them. Uh, maybe you want to have a risk taker or you want to have someone that is very safe and reliable in the decisions. And so you evaluate people by maybe their risk-taking capabilities. So the example Hemming made up was, he said 95% is the average for everyone in your company and the risk-taking capabilities of this guy is, uh, is 95%. So if he does not do anything, he won't increase and he won't decrease. But is this good? If you want to have a risk taker, uh, if you want to have no risk takers, they won't talk, take any risk because the average can't be changed. But what about shifting the average to 20%? So everyone has a risk average of 20%. Uh, 20% and to level this up, you have to take some risks and you have to say, okay, I would like to take this risk. Okay, it's working out. And then you get a better average. So it depends on the scale you're using for finding personnel. He said, okay, risk taking might be something you would like to have later on in the company, because when you want to have a new CEO, this CEO sometimes has to take risks because when you want to have a smooth running company, everything is fine with someone that's not taking risks. But when you are in deep trouble, for example, the coronavirus, Sometimes it's good to have a risk taker to put everything on one card and even either save the company or he said it or rock the boat. But then it's at least a fast decision. So and you have to be sure what is your goal, what is the thing, the, the achievement you would like to have um, to adjust your scale accordingly. So I would like to do a test with the class. I said, okay. We have a measurement scale and I have two groups of people. We have one group on the top, that's this group, and we have one group on the button, that's this group. 
Okay? That's clear. For the person uh, one, his uh, rating is, he is number five from a group out of six. And then the second, the second person, he is person number two, uh, number two, three out of six. Hopefully everything is unclear now. <laughs> so person one is number five out of six. Uh, person two is number three out of six. Which one would you choose to hire? And I will, I will, I will go down and ask everyone uh, like they appear on my Zoom screen. So Don, <laughs> you're first. Which person would you like to choose? I would ask somebody smarter than me. Sorry. Is not voting a lot? <laughs> no, 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 no. You have to choose one. Person one or person two. You need someone to hire. I have to choose one. Yep. Okay. Person number two. Okay. We go for person number two. Number one. Marty? Number one. You go for number one. Okay. Michelle? I'm also going to go for number one. Number one. John? I feel like this is a trick question, but I'm going to go with number two. <laughs> okay. Let's go for Bird. I go for number two. Okay, and Mike or, already showed, okay, number two. Okay, oh, sorry. Someone left in my Zoom window? No, so I did not get any. One, um, we are eight. Lauren is not answering. We have six. Okay, so two of you would hire person number one, and one of uh, you would hire person number two. And I already put out the, the grading scale, and you see, when it comes to school grades, Person number one got an A minus as in a GPA. Person number two got an C, although compared to the group, he is a, we say, worse than person number one. So it's uh, like um, Hemming said, it's always about the scale and the things uh, you measure. That's just an, as an example. And who came up with, it's a trick question. I think it was Marty, right? Oh no, John. John said, okay, it could be a trick question. Yes, it was a trick question, but uh, it was an example to, to focus on the problem. Okay, let's go on. And what you choose to measure. It's very easy to measure things like height and weight, um, but those, those things that are easy to measure are not always the things you would like to have. Because when you are going for a new CEO, maybe it's uh, more in your favor to measure how good this guy is taking risks or how good this, this guy in, in leadership. But when you just say, okay, that's too hard to measure and I will go for measuring the height, then everyone in the company is measured. You measure everyone in the company and you just choose the guy with the, with the biggest or largest size. And... Yep, you will have a CEO that's maybe seven, seven foot four, <laughs> but is it the right guy? I don't know. So there's always confusion between what you measured and what you should have measured. Um, another example Hemming came up with was intelligence quotient testing. He's not a big fan of the actual scale, but he said, okay, we have to stick with it. Um, he said, this scale is made up with a bunch of questions, a lot of questions, and it was tested for the small sample. But as we know from statistics, we all did some classes in there. Um, you can do a model, a regression line, and say, okay, which questions are relevant and which questions are irrelevant. And then when you come up with a model and you take all the questions out that are irrelevant, then you only have questions that are relevant um, and then you use only those relevant questions and um, calibrate them with a larger sample size. So what you get when you measure the intelligence and you make up the test like it is, you get a normal, normally distributed sample or normally distribution. Um, this does not say anything. But 
the original intelligent scale was made up that I didn't know that, that for the first 20 years of your life, the IQ for a child of six is the same like the IQ um, from a child of 12. So they, they scaled or they put together a scale that will be highly reliable for people from zero to 20. So how can you use this to measure intelligence of some guy, maybe 25, 70, 75? There's no way, but maybe no one is interested in, in the intelligence, intelligence quotient of people that are a little bit older. Okay, I will leave this to you <laughs> um, and come to the next topic. Um, that was uh, very funny to read this the first time, the distribution of grades. My experience at MPS is exactly the way Hemming describes it. Um, you can, uh, Hemming's claim is you can create any distribution of grades you want. The example on the top, if all questions are equally difficult, you have a pass-fail distribution. Because you, you get the questions or you don't get the questions. So the second example Henning came up with said, okay, we can also produce normal distribution because we, when we use some easy, some hard and some medium, most medium questions, then the easy questions could be answered by everyone. And the hard questions could be an, answered by someone. Most of the guys will be able to answer some of the medium questions. So we get a, a normal distribution we all know very good from MPS. And his claim was, if the teacher knows the class very well, he can create any distribution he wants. So here's an example from MPS, real life example. <laughs> don't, don't try to track down the teacher or the professor, but um, you see uh, four distributions. The one on the left, the top left, is the great statistics for our midterm, for the first midterm we wrote. And let's call it, it's a kind of left skewed, normally distributed, and it, it wasn't that good. Um, you can see me in the light blue bar. But then we had to write a paper in this class, and the paper distribution was a little bit better, right skewed, and we got some points for participation. So everyone got 100% for participation. And then it came to the final exam. And you see the, the distribution for the final exam is a little bit more right skewed. But this would have come out to an, an average for me of 84.03%. But I was one of the better guys in this class. And I think the professor was afraid of having a bunch of guys getting C's. And I have heard a rumor at NPS that if you have a student that gets a C, you have to report to the department chair. So there was some extra credit coming in. <laughs> and I, I will see how this was adjusted. So we got an extra credit for using LaTeX. I, I hope it's pronounced right for LaTeX and for using LaTeX for our paper. And we got an extra quiz set up with 15 points. And uh, you see the distribution. The, this one didn't work out as well as the professor thought, but it added to something. And uh, when you use those points for extra credit, and you see this for my grade, um, it turned out that I now have 91.13%. And I got an A minus instead of a B. Um, so it kind of worked. So it leveled up um, the, the average in the class, but only because we had some extra credit. So because it's on YouTube, I think uh, John and Bert will be able to track down which class this was. <laughs> okay, let's go for the next one. Um, scoring systems. Hemming is a big fan of using uh, the whole dynamic range of uh, scoring. Um, my first the first time I met a scale like this was an evolution report from, uh, I got from Microsoft. 
And this one was going from uh, zero to 10. And I talked to some guys of them and he said, yeah, could you please send us our evolution reports because our salary for next year and our, our flexible amount is hardly relying on this. And I said, okay, I can do this. Yeah, but please do us a favor. If you are not, if you are not grading us with nines and tens, we are in trouble. I said, how do you mean this? Yeah, if you do anything from zero to eight, we have to report to our boss why this is so bad. And if we have a nine or 10, everything is fine. I said, okay, I understand this. This is exactly what Hemming is describing here. Um, when we have a scale from one to nine, with five being the average, he said he claims most people will choose a four or a six. So when it comes to grading a person, and uh, Bert and I agree, uh, don't agree on this person. Um, so Bert is uh, most likely to say, okay, um, I dislike this person and uh, dislike uh, would be uh, lower than the average. So it will be a four. I would do this calculation on the slide. And I say, okay, but I like this person and I'm a fan of a dynamic range. So I will grade this person as an eight. So on average, we have uh, one person that likes um, the professor and one person that dislikes the professor. On average, it should be neutral, right? But now when we calculate the average of, of both of our points, one using the whole scale and the other one don't using the whole scale, we come up to 12 points divided by two equals six. So the average is five. So with me using the whole range of this dynamic scale, I outvoted Bert's initial vote. So one thing learned from Hemming today is the next time you get in the dynamic range, use the whole range if you want to have your opinion to matter. Um, the next point uh, on the lower half of the slide is saying, uh, he's saying scoring system communicating information only have maximum anthropic entropy when all symbols used equally. Um, coming back to the NPS grading system, when you have classes, um, when you have a range from A, B, C, D, and F, and you only use A's and B's, you can literally divide the class in good students, bad students, and you just give them a group at the end of the class, you're in the better half or in the, you're in the, in the uh, worst half of the class. So that's literally what happens at NPS. One point about peer assessment. We had a professor in the very first, first quarter that used peer assessment. But the problem with peer assessment is when uh, we sit in the same boat and I have to grade, for example, Bert's code, I wouldn't do any harm to him. And I would say, yeah, you are a bad coder and your code doesn't work. So I would grade him to not hurt him, maybe 98, 98 out of 100%. And Bert would, would do the same with me. So if the professor is not checking our peer grading, uh, what is happening, we get all good grades because we don't want to do any harm to each other, but that doesn't help anyone, right? We all get A's and everyone is doing awesome, great, outstanding, but someone has to tell the truth. So the professor wasn't that stupid. He said, okay, I would grade the peer assignment too. So if I catch you giving a good grade to someone that's code is really bad and really ugly and he failed, uh, then you will get a bad grade on your peer assignment, on your peer assessment. So that's the way you can do it. I don't know whether it did, it did work because I got an A, Bert got an A. I don't know what John got in Python, but I think an A. <laughs> so, but at least it was an approach, right? And when it comes to uh, rating people, um, Hemming came up with an example at Bell Labs. They did two different ratings, one for promotion, and one for the salary. Because for promotion, they had to select who will be the new leader and who will be the CEO, and one for salary. And for salary, I think 
he, he didn't came up with an exact answer, but I think for salary, everyone would be very average. So they don't have to pay um, as much um, as, as, uh, for the salary because when they say, okay, everyone is awesome, outstanding, excellent, then they would have to pay outstanding salaries. But for promotion, because they divided those two ratings, they could say, okay, everyone is doing great and outstanding and it would, it wouldn't have any effect on uh, salary, but they could have something to judge um, whether someone is promoted or not. Um, and he said, okay, people do not like to rate people because when, uh, for example, me, Michelle and uh, me, uh, Michelle and I, we are in the same uh, group, we both attend kernels, and someone has to come down to us, a kernel, and said, okay, Michelle, you are first, Toby, you're second. Then I would say, okay, why I am second? <laughs> and uh, maybe I would take this personal. And uh, when you have uh, some supervisors and they are very, um, they, they would like to have a good relationship with, with everyone, then they, maybe they would refuse to, to, to rate you in a way and wouldn't, would avoid to tell you the truth just to be good friend with you for the next two years. Hemming put some criticize in his book uh, when it comes to hiring at NPS, uh, with hiring at NPS and hiring at N universities in, in uh, common. And he said, okay, uh, normally psychology departments and faculty and staff are very mixed up people. They have uh, different types, dif different characters of people. But for the computer science department and for mathematics departments, they have, he called it inbreed. Um, back in his times, he said, um, it was a very, very bad habit of a university to hire your own graduates. But when it comes to our times and you take a look at some departments, you can see a lot of people that graduated at the same university they are now working on. Um, and he criticized this because uh, when you graduate somewhere, you have the mindset of the department you graduated with. And there is no innovation coming from outside. You're just sitting there in your own, in, in, in the own area and the own area of interest and the interest of the professors you graduated with. Um, and there, you, you don't see anything different from other universities. But when there would be a rule to kick graduates out of the door for at least three years and have them uh, study or work for a company or do some research at other universities, and then they came back, uh, come back and you hire them again. That wouldn't be a problem because they have some extra knowledge from outside they can bring in, and it would be very effective for the research of the university that hires them. Same with companies, right? Um, he, is coming, he came up with a, with a story about board of directors, and when you have a board of directors, you, it's, it's, like, it's like a small club. You have five or seven people, in there and uh, when uh, someone retires you would like to have this guy uh, replaced and then you are looking for a successor and the problem is when you just hire someone and it comes to the next decision and you you can't rely on this guy um, it could be that he's blocking all of the decisions that would have been much easier with the old guy so we're trying to find someone for the board of directors that is in the same mindset as you are. So it's very easy to get a decision, but it's not the best for the company. So Hemming came up and said, okay, for a board of directors, it could be useful to have three or four people from the inside and some people from the outside. So they get a broader view and another view uh, to the board of directors. And the example he said, uh, the, the, the outcome would be, that the three guys or four guys from the inside of the company uh, sitting at the board of directors would have to make their decisions with having in mind that some guys from the outside will judge those decisions. So uh, Hemming claims that they will come up with different types of decisions because someone from the outside is sitting there uh, judging them. 
So the, the bigger picture, how he called it, is coming because you have people from the outside um, judging you. Another part I would like to talk about is uh, personal employment. When uh, you have a human resource office and you have an open position, for example, at Moves, and you would like to have an, I call it nerd, that is doing Unity and X, maybe X3D all day, and you send out the human resource de research department and they are trying to hire, him, uh, hire someone, it could be that uh, during the job interview, the guy sitting there makes a very weird first impression or has left a very weird first impression because he's unsure, but he is a very, very great Unity or X3D programmer, then most likely the human research people, uh, human resource people would not hire them because they said, okay, now that that guy is awkward, that that's not looking the way we'd like to have a, an employee of our company look. But then Hemming claimed and said, maybe we would like to have an awkward behaving nerd, but we would like to have a good programmer. He does not have to have social skills because he's just sitting on his computer. And that's what Henning said. He went out um, to the field and he hired the guys he would like to work with. Yeah? And it uh, doesn't matter with whether this guy is 400 pounds um, or has, has glasses like this. Um, he does not have to look good. He, has, does, he does have to code in a very a good way. Oh, I already talked about inbreeding and leadership, so we can go over the slide. Hemming came up with automatic versus uh, human judgments. Um, he said when you have a machine doing automatic judgment based on numbers, it's a very good approach because uh, you get reliable judgments. So when you have a, a person grading stuff, you will always have some um, subjective feedback or some subjective objects in there. The next thing Hemming came up with was um, an example. Every soldier at NPS or every soldier, every soldier in our class will have um, experienced in his uh, lifetime. Um, expect inspections um, of the troops are sometimes scheduled and sometimes random. And he claimed when you do a random inspection, that's the optimal point, but most of the time you get scheduled inspections. Scheduled inspection mean um, you know when the inspectors will come, you know why the inspectors will come, and you know from your experience what the inspector will focus on, what the inspectors will focus on. So when the inspector is focusing on maybe your readiness, um, then uh, they will just take notes on readiness and they grade you on that. And uh, when they show up the next time and will inspect your deployability or the whatever you pick, then you will just be graded on this. So you have time to prepare for the field, for this special area of interest they're going to grade and going to inspect. And uh, Hemming says, okay, maybe that's not the thing you would like to have. Um, maybe it's better to do a random inspection and inspect all of the stuff you would like to have numbers for and do it all on the same day. But he said, okay, what is random? Um, because uh, armies or armed forces are getting smaller and smaller, you always have an interconnection between some guys and uh, there's some guy knowing some guy knowing some guy and maybe there's someone sitting in the, in the back office of a general and he's calling his buddy and say, yeah, maybe next Tuesday there will be a flight that's in your area. Maybe it's better to prepare for an inspection. So it's a random scheduled inspection, he claimed it. And he said, that's, that's not a big thing. That's not a problem. But it, when, when it comes to modeling and simulation and when it comes to data we need for those simulation things. What kind of data do we need or what kind of data do we use? We need data that is reliable to have reliable and repeatable simulation outcomes. 
but what we use are those numbers from scheduled inspections. So we always have a readiness of 95%. We always have a deployability of 95%, but those are not real values, but we run our simulations on those values. So there was a lot of critique uh, from him when he was talking about those inspections. Um, when it comes to uh, scaling, um, was a very funny example he had. He said, okay, the scale of things you measure is very, very important. I will use the example in the lower half of the, of the slide. He said, okay, I will explain to you, I have a herd of five cows and then there will be, there will be three additional cows coming to my herd. And I said, okay, I will have more than 50% of my herd on top. So now I have eight. The increase of my herd is by three cows. But what if, if I heard, uh, have a herd of 1000 cows in there and I add three cows to it? It's 0.3%. So the change in increase is, is a, a very, very small, but the absolute amount of cows, uh, cows added to my herd is, yeah, it's the same. So it's, it's all about the scale. When it comes to scales, and uh, this has a little bit to do with the uh, slides before when it comes to inspections, it's also uh, with companies, when you get reports on your business, and you have the lower management reporting to the upper management saying, okay, how, have we, uh, how did we do uh, the last couple of quarters? And the lower management, they grab all the numbers and report it to the upper management. And they will, they will not make up figures, but maybe they bend the figures a little bit. You have some uh, levels of management between the lower management and the upper management. You have some middle management. And maybe the middle management is also paid by how good they are doing or for how good they are doing. And maybe the middle management has some intrinsic motivation to bend the numbers a little bit more to get more, more of their flexible payment. And Hemming claims that the higher you go in a hierarchy, the more the numbers are bended and the more the reports are well written to match the expectations of the higher management. So he said every leader um, in a higher management has to know how to lie with charts and how to lie with statistics and has to you do prudence to check all the figures and claims that are presented to you. Otherwise, you won't have any idea how your company is doing. I have an example for my thesis um, when it comes to the whole stuff we spoke about for the last 35, 40 minutes. Um, you always have to know ground truth and you have to know what you measure. When I did the first run in my thesis of a DRS simulation, I use We Are Forces, that's a workstation that's uh, spitting out DRS packages. You, you see a table having the computer, CPU, RAM, and PDUs recorded in there. And the example I used was a army ground scenario running on Hawaii. I just recorded the first three minutes of 52 entities. And I was interested in how many entities and how many PDUs are coming across the wire. So I did this with a, with a laptop. I think the third one is in this table and I said, okay, it's a pretty decent setup. And I was able to record 695 PDUs. And I said that that could be three minutes. It's about 180 seconds. So that's round about three and a half to four PDUs per second. That's not ground truth. I said, okay, let's do it with my desktop computer. That's a more powerful computer. That's the one in the lowest row. And I said, okay, with this customized desktop, I was able to get 12,762 PDUs. And Donald, I talked about it and said, 
there must be something that correlates with uh, PDUs being captured. So I did a field test. I said, okay, I have five different computers and at, uh, setups at home. I will do it with all of them. Yeah. I, I don't know whether 12,763 is the ground truth, but it was the highest number I could record. And I, I did not have a more powerful computer and a better network setup to try to get more PDUs. So I assume this is ground truth, but I can't prove it. So the tools you, you use for measuring, correlating to the outcome you have, and if you, if, you, if you don't know what and how to measure, how can you measure? And coming to the last slide, Hemming's final thoughts. Just because a measurement is popular, it does not make it reliable and accurate. When you come up and have to create a rating system, you always have to think, what do I want to measure? What do I need to measure? And is the thing, the easy thing I could easily measure, really the right thing? And will it be something that helps me in the long run? Any questions on this? Morning, I got lots of questions, so you guys might want to go first. Oh, come on. Your grade depends on it. Wow, even the big guns couldn't. couldn't. Tough crowd, tough crowd. Ready to finish. Thank you, Toby. <laughs> I assume I answered everything, so no questions left. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Right. Toby's grade doesn't depend on it. Everybody else's grade depends on it. Yours too, Marty. Uh, okay, okay, Don. Good. You you uh, baited me one. Can I can I ask you a question? Okay, you get what you measure. In the discussion or any other related things you've read, did Hamming go into measurement noise? Yeah. What, the act of measuring sometimes induces error. And if the problem is complex, you could have a nonlinear chaotic result. Did you find anything in your studies of Hamming on that? I think for when he came up with code correction, error correction, he talked about, about noise and how you measure things and how you can decide whether it's a one or a zero when you have noise on the height of a one. Okay, that was part of it, but I meant when you're doing math, you measure something, and let's say you're still on base 10. And the very act of measuring it, say you're doing a least squares optimization problem, and you're inverting a matrix. I believe I have saw, and I, I apologize, I, I guess I'm the ringer in the room. I've probably read 40,000 words, I'm sorry, three or 4,000 pages of, on Hamming. And early on, he talked about error in computation. Certain things are linear error. If you have a 1% error and you add it to something else with 1% error, you would expect the results. But if you do division or matrix inversion, which involves divisions, errors propagate. For those who are interested in this topic, either in this class or those who look at this video later on, I Google Hamming talking about error propagation in common mathematical numerical methods. Thanks. Who else? 
Okay, here we go. Great work. I think there's some subtleties here that are worth bringing up. One is everything Toby said, everything Hammock says applies not just to people, not just to, to groups, not just to students and classes, but to sensors and to feedback loops and to processes and even to teams and organizations. It plays at all of these different levels. And the title, You Get What You Measure, is it's, it, it indicates that it's both self-fulfilling or self-defeating, depending on what you measure. And therefore, those choices are fundamental to the design. I think that we've seen in the modeling and simulation domain, I know you pointed at it in the slides, Toby, but we've had long discussions on this. If you can't measure what you're expecting, what are you talking about? Okay. In modeling, representations are really important. And if you can't measure those representations, then is your model, model really valid? Is it, is it confirmable, much less repeatable? Toby, did you see any specific cases like that you think are worth mentioning here? You've, you've seen a lot of this stuff. Mm. Yeah. Well, I'll offer one just from, from what you said. If those five computers are running the same simulation, is one better than the other by a factor of 12,000 over 300? No. Huh? Huh? What are we measuring here? You know, the ability to spew data or, or to have representative data that makes sense. Oh, so there's a, a face value example of, well, thank you for that nice measurement, but all it kind of indicates is A, hardware, B, is a software installed, and C, maybe the network, the congestion. Okay, but it doesn't really say anything about what are you getting at other than there's a capacity there. Here's some other things that are really interesting about this. Measurement noise. Measurement noise. Oh, what is what is the noise? Is that an error in our in our value or is it in our sensor or in our representation or is it just some other thing that we haven't recognized yet? So there's there's a whole line of inquiry analysis that needs to be done and things like that. IQ testing. Survey question, how many people here have taken an IQ test? You know, you younger people, older people, it doesn't matter. We're, we're too old to be smart. No, a lot of that's gone away, it, but, but there are still some tests, right? How about in the United States, the SAT and the ACT. That's always been controversial. And for many of the reasons you said and a few others, here are some recent things. Oh, it's still controversial and controversial to the point that a number of major colleges announced that they're no longer accepting them. Not, not no longer acquiring them, no longer accepting them because they think the bias factors are so great that unequal evaluations of different individuals, that influences of how good their educational system was or their race or their culture in their city or state or countryside over dominate the, that exam. So they're, turning to other metrics, which we, if we apply the, if we apply the, you get what you measure. Oh, oh, they're trying to assess who will be a good student, who can excel, who's appropriate for the school, not who did well on the exam. You see a, a different manifestation on this also in the papers, in the news quite frequently, and, and this is not particularly new, but it, definitely bears repeating. Diversity. Diversity leads to 
better decision making, consideration of more alternatives, differences of opinion are healthy and good. Oh, so isn't this interesting? Isn't this interesting? And then if when we apply, you get what you measure, that points the finger right back at you. What are you measuring? What are you getting? What are you expecting? They're maybe not the same. Two more things. I first will go up to higher level of extraction, then we'll go off into your domain. First up. It's been very interesting to see how organizations, be they universities or companies or military services or communities of interest, gee, if they don't set goals, how do you know if you're getting anywhere? How do you know if you're making progress? How do you know if you're working on the right problem? It's her people figure out something else to measure. And you can really tell the difference in groups as to whether they have a long-term goal, whether they have metrics along the way to get there. Oop, I said it again. Uh, I'm trying to say fewer of those. Here are some interesting words about that. Resilience. How adaptable is a group? Do unexpected setbacks? How do you measure that? Well, you got to compare it to something, right? Your resilience, what's the setback? What's the goal? What are the metrics of product? You have to understand your problem and what you're about. That's really interesting. A common phrase these days, it's maybe political speak or just the current term, corporate culture. Anybody read about that? Seen that? Some of you all are sooner or later going into this civilian world where corporate culture. Oh, yes, we want you to read our corporate culture. This is who we are. Okay, y'all done now. Let's get back to the, you know, their, their degrees of how much that's happy talk and how much that really is. And I think that's just interesting to you folks, particularly because we're not just social observers. You're not. You're leaders. Leaders, meaning other people are looking at you and going, yeah, what are we doing? Where are we going? And you're not just leaders of people, but you're leaders of leaders. Oh, yeah. What are your leaders saying? What are they telling their people? Are we all rowing together? Do you have the diversity on your teams to handle the range of goals and be resilient in the face of obstacles to get there? Well, <laughs> How do you measure that? <laughs> Welcome to the front line, people. I'm, I'm glad you all are super competent because you can handle it. And then, oh, there's an old, by the way, in the in university, the current term for this is grade inflation. We must fight grade inflation. Uh, uh, why? What, what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to graduate students who are all very specialized in, at least in Naval Postgraduate School, highly competent, highly qualified, or you wouldn't be here. And you're going back to somewhere where they expect you to be competent at an even higher level. We started this very talk with the question you'll never hear. What were your grades? Right, grade in place, I think it's irrelevant. I think. Thesis, oh, wow, well, now there's a metric. What was your thesis? What was it about? What, do you, what should we do next? What are your recommendations? Interesting, interesting. And finally, in case this all seems abstract or just theoretical or conceptual, for especially for warfighters, there's this little thing called the OODA loop, the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, act. This won't be on the screen. Any show of hands there? OODA loop. If you haven't read it yet, I recommend it before. I'll recommend it again. Read the book Boyd, B-O-Y-D, about John Boyd, who came up with the OODA loop or synthesized these concepts. 
And frankly, uh, there have been wars won. There have been wars avoided because of groups, military teams' ability to have a tighter OODA loop, meaning, oh, we can observe, orient, decide, and act faster than the other person. Not better, faster. You see this reflected in some of the pandemic stuff now. Oh, it, who is going to be most adaptive to change? What areas will react and come back? Not about better, it's about faster. Okay, so check question. How do you measure that? How do you measure that? Oh, well, we're observing. Oh, there's, there's a good chance to measure. And then we're orienting and we're deciding and then we're acting and then and, and as you again observe, you're observing not just what you're looking at in the first place, but what were the changes from your actions? Oh, oh, so you get what you measure is actually absolutely aligned with OODA loop and all that is. And the more you think about that, the more I suspect you'll find that it's not just a tactical, it's not just a strategic, it's business, it's organizational, it's teams, it's personal individual growth, it's ability of folks able to work together towards a common goal, it's ability to supervise, excuse me, it's your ability to lead your leaders who are leading others, you get what you measure. I'll, I'll go check my medication now, but any, any reactions to all that? Okay, thanks. Uh, for all the happy faces nodding up and down, like, yes, let's take a break. So, yes, let's take a break. Well, thank you once more, Toby, as we thank each of you for a lot of really stimulating talks that were provoked by Hamming's thoughts. And here we are just playing through some of the ripples that remains our core material, our core resources. It's the man himself talking about how he's seen all this. Okay, so short break, and then we'll come back to the most popular Hamming talk, you and your research. See you there.